Welcome to um, side event 105, which is basically about ice cube. And we will talk today about uh, the significance of data cubes in earth observation, how data cubes can be used in machine learning uh, using high, high resolution time series, uh, SAR data. Uh, my name is Muhammad Irfan Ali. I'm a machine learning um, engineer in ISI. So I've been working in ISI for now uh, two and a half years. Um, and yeah, I've been mostly doing uh, machine learning development and some machine learning operations as well. And apart from that, also doing some Python uh, modules development. Um, so working in a very dynamic environment and learning uh, as I go. Uh, and my background is in uh, actually electrical engineering. I did my bachelor's and then I studied in Aalto University. I did the robotics and uh, machine learning. So yeah, that... Uh, that's about it my, for my introduction. And maybe Arno, you can uh, sure introduce yourself as well. So hi, hi everyone. So my name is Arno Duperin. So I'm working as a data scientist uh, at ISI. So I joined ISI one year, a few months ago, uh, where I joined like the ML team. So I worked on different ML projects, ML ops, and also infrastructure. Um, but today my role will be like a bit different. So I will be in charge of like executing like uh, Jupyter cells. Uh, we really wanted like to take um, like to take the most of this like um, side event and just go with like a live uh, example. Um, hopefully, at the end of the live example, you will uh, you will be like um, you will be uh, interested by like using IceCube in um, your current processes. So yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, I will I will give back to uh, Erfan. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so. One, one thing I just want to mention here, I know that uh, as if you're joining as a guest, you cannot really uh, like just, just ask questions. So if something comes up, just put it on a chat and then we will try to address it as, as soon as possible. So the agenda for today is, uh, and this does not include uh, the, the problem that we're into. So uh, just the presentation, we will start with that. Uh, I will talk about data cubes, their importance, why they are needed in uh, EO um, uh, domain. Uh, and then we will talk about ice cubes, which is basically the data cubes that we're generating with the ISI SAR data and uh, the building blocks of that. And uh, as Agno mentioned, yeah, we will be touching upon um, ice cubes with machine learning example as well. I will also walk you through the GitHub repository that we have uh, created as part of this project, and it is open source in Python. Um, and hope you like the documentation that we have set up there as well. All right, so let's jump into this thing. Uh, yeah, so as, as some of you might already know that this was a project that we did with the collaboration with ESA and it was under AI for SAR project. And the idea was that we want to create an infrastructure that facilitates uh, creating AI oriented data cubes using multi temporal and multi instance angle uh, SAR data. So if you um, just ponder upon this, this problem statement, it's quite generic. And uh, this is what at least we really liked. Uh, about this project that it was very open-ended and there was like so many different ways to approach this problem, uh, which makes it very interesting as well. Um, and I, I hope that by end of this presentation, you know a bit more about the methodology, methodology and the design that we have chose for the ice cube and hopefully you give it a try as well. Uh, one thing I want to touch upon just briefly is that data cube, uh, when we talk about them, um, uh, it's, it's quite a generic term. And it can be quite subjective as well, depending on your context or depending on the application that you have been using. Uh, but for the sake of this presentation, we can consider data cubes as multidimensional arrays. Um, and data cubes, generically, if we talk, talk about them, they are information words that contain a lot of information. They're massive in size. And the idea there is that the user can easily jump in to a data cube, slice the, uh, the information that they want. They don't really have to like load the whole data cube. They can just ask for some information, they get that, and then they are on their way. And that's what makes data cubes really magical because you put so much useful information somewhere, but of course, not all of the users want the same information. They want chunks of their information according to their requirements. One question might pop into mind is that, all right, so data cubes, they are magical, they're very nice, but why do we need them in, in the EO domain? Um, I'm going to talk about a problem that is very well known in the Earth observation domain, and that is that um, the a lot of big EO data is untapped. Uh, so the information, uh, so the so the rate at which the, uh, the data is being generated in uh, with Earth observation or remote sensing, uh, it's not the same at which 
that data is being analyzed. And that's for, for a good reason, because when we talk about the space-borne data, it's it's not easy to analyze. There are a lot of caveats involved with this thing, for example, uh, calibration, reprojections, um, and uh, co-registration, and et cetera. That is why you need these EO experts who can actually help you to process the data and put them in a nice format, and then somewhere down the pipeline, uh, and machine learning engineer like me can actually use it. Um, but the problem, and traditionally, actually, these this, uh, um, remote sensing engineers or experts, they have been putting these guidelines as well for people to use it. But the problem with this approach is that the, the burden of this data processing, it shifts from data uh, providers to data consumers. And the idea with their data cubes is that we want to make sure that uh, this burden this or this um, responsibility of data processing, it remains at the data providers. So they basically uh, process the data, they create nice analysis related data, and then they put it in the data cube format, and then they ship it to the community. So community can easily use it. People who have no experience with the Earth observation domain, they can use it. And uh, this is where we see a lot of value of data cubes that they bridge the gap between the EO domain and the community. And one thing I want to also mention here that uh, working with the, with the space mode data is one thing, but if you're working with SAR data, it's just another thing because like one layer more difficulty on top of the space one data. So that's uh, even more necessary to uh, create that analysis ready data for, for the community in order to encourage them that you go and use it. We have a question. I think we can take that. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, IceCube. Uh, so on, on the left side, you can see that uh, we have a typical ice stack. And uh, if you're not familiar what stack is, it's basically we have an area, area of interest or an AOI somewhere on the earth. And as we go around that AOI, we acquire more and more images and then the stack grows in the size. And here you can see that we have this slant range geometry. So we have the face information as well. Um, and on the right side, you can see that we basically present the same information, but in kind of like data queue format. But also you can consider or like you can imagine in the middle that we do some processing as well. So taking uh, like uh, like the individual acquisitions and concatenating them in the data queue format and putting them in a nice data structure that the users can easily use. Um, and the data structure choice that we have for the data cube, it's called X-Array. If you look at uh, the most uh, state-of-the-art implementations of any data cube, uh, particularly for machine learning, they, they actually use uh, X-Array as well. And that is for a good reason because they work with the multi-dimensional arrays and they uh, support DASC uh, for multi-processing multi um, or to kind of like um, help to do parallel processing. Um, yeah, so if we now put it kind of things in more perspective, we can see that we have this uh, with XRA when we're working with them, we have this individual data sets which are also called like the data variables. So we have amplitude, we have face, and then we can add as many data variables as we want. And if we zoom in into one data, data set, then we can see that we have this stack of data arrays. And this each data array, basically, it represents your one acquisition. Uh, so we take these acquisitions, we put them into, and in, convert them into data arrays, and then we uh, concatenate them uh, under different variables. And uh, we, have, we have basically the uh, data cubes for with ISI. Uh, data. As I mentioned that uh, for the data structure, we are using X-Array, uh, we are using Dask as well. Uh, one thing we want to make sure that any user uh, can actually is able to generate massive data cubes using their ordinary laptop. And this is where the Dask really, really helps because it uh, does the chunking of your data into smaller tiles that fit into your memory. And then you can do the lazy operations on those uh, chunks or tiles. Um, and and the task only loads the data when it's needed. Otherwise, it just keeps them uh, in, in like in kind of like uh, it just put, keeps the hash hash in memory. Um, and then finally, uh, we we uh, for storing our data cube, we are working with the next CDF four format. Um, if you're not familiar with this one, it's just a, it's just a wrapper on on top of HDF five with some improved features. And of course, everything that we're working in, it's uh, written in in Python. So I hope this kind of gives you gives you an overview of okay we have this uh, data that we are generating as we go around an AOI and we have a stack growing and then we basically present the same information in the, in the data cube format with, with a bit of uh, processing in in the middle as well. 
Yeah, and as I mentioned that we want to make sure that the data cubes that we generate, they integrate seamlessly into machine learning applications. Uh, and that is why we have uh, also added um, a, a, like a sub data cube in, in the ice cube that is called the labels data cube. And the labels data cube, they contain um, the labels for your supervised machine learning models, both in raster and the vector format as well. And the idea here was that um, we didn't want user to work with multiple files. Uh, we want to make sure that we have only one pit stop where you can come and then you can access your access your X or you can access your Y as well. So input and the output data. So you can easily index it, you can easily slice it uh, um, along a dimension and then you have the data that you want. And uh, that was the motivation of putting the labels data cube as well. So you can have your sort inf information, which is amplitude, phase information. You can also have your real complex data as Agno will demonstrate in the example as well. Then you can also have your labels uh, there as well. And then of course, uh, as I mentioned, we're working with X-Ray. It uh, works or integrates great with, uh, with the NumPy and tensors. So if you can easily integrate it with your favorite machine learning framework, be it PyTorch, TensorFlow or, or any other. And uh, on the left side, you can also see that uh, there's a user configuration. Um, uh, and uh, this is where uh, we want to make sure that we make it easier for the user to do uh, basically the iterations or A-B testing. Um, so so if, you have, if you want to do some seasonality uh, analysis, some, if you're working with agricultural data or vegetation, then this can come really uh, handy as well. So you can work with the temporal resolution. You can change it. I want to look at the data, not one day apart, but a week apart or a month apart. Or if you want to look at the summer compared to uh, winter season, you can do that as well. So you can change the start date and end date. And of course, you can also work with the incidence angles. Um, if you have worked with SAR, you know that incidence angle is one of the most important parameters of SAR data. Uh, depending on which incidence angle you get the image, if you have a smaller incidence angle, you will have a lot of backscatter from the objects. But if you have a bigger one, then your microwaves, they uh, basically scatter away from the sensor and you will get receive less of them. So um, the scene would be a bit more darker. And it gets very interesting to see how your machine learning model is dependent on the incidence angle. For example, if you're doing uh, vessel detection, you want to see, okay, if I take the incidence angle from 15 degrees to, to 21 degrees, or, or like this kind of extreme angles from 20, 31 degrees to 36 degrees, then how does my model behave compared to a bit more nominal instance angle range, which might be 25 degrees, 24 degrees. Um, yeah, so ice cubes with the user configuration, it, they may, it makes it really easier for, for the user to access the information uh, in the in the for the input and the output data and you don't really have to like go out of this and everything is pretty much pre-processed you don't really need to uh, for example do the back projections uh, of the labels or go from map geometry to to image geometry or the other way around you have everything over there you just start slicing the data and then you can uh, get ready with that uh, and this is something that Agno will show with the live live demo as well uh, yeah and we have uh, uh, basically, the our GitHub repository that I will talk about just in a minute. Also, we have um, the uh, so also we have the website uh, where we are talking about this. Uh, basically, the landing page for the whole project. So, if you are interested, we will be demonstrating some more useful um, applications. For example, um, flood, flood mapping um, uh, and etc. with the data cubes uh, as well. So, please stay tuned for that. Here's the team, and then also you can you can have a look um, at the first blog post that talks about uh, the whole project and kind of like summarizes the gist. Uh, so you can please go to our website, and then you can you can have a look here as well. Um, there's another blog post, the second one, which is coming soon. Uh, it will be within a two weeks or so, and we will also open source um, that data set as well, so you can start playing playing with that. Uh, so I hope you can see my screen for the documentation. Uh, actually, before going to documentation, let's go through uh, the GitHub repository. So this is the one that we have created. Uh, um, one thing we have mentioned that, um, or one thing we have noticed is that when it comes to this kind of libraries, people do a lot of work on the development and the feature integration, but we don't have a lot of support for users to get started. And this is where we have worked a lot on, on MK documentation. 
we have tried to make it as simpler as as uh, for the user to pick up this library and start uh, getting with this one. Uh, this is not meant to be a unicorn library. This is meant to be something that sparks for kind of like an ambition in, in the community to get started with the machine learning with the SAR data. So they can, so there's like this initial barrier or this gap that gets, uh, that, that gets reduced. Um, and we are very much eager to hear from you guys. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about this one? If you like it, of course, uh, give it a thumbs up and star as well. Um, yeah, we are, we're accepting pull requests. We're also accepting some features if you have any. Um, and if I go into the documentation, I'm just gonna spend like a few, few minutes here. Uh, so this is basically the landing page, the home page. Uh, we pretty much covered this in the presentation as well, but feel free to go through this when, when you have time. Um, we have the guidelines for the installation. It should be pretty, pretty simple. Um, so far, nobody has have had any issues with installation, so it should be fine if you're using your PIP or uh, Python or Conda virtual environments. Uh, and then we have uh, basically the five notebook examples that we have put together uh, that talks about uh, different um, examples. So the first one is basically how you can create a data cube that only works with the SAR data, so just working with the, with the SAR information. Uh, the second example talks about okay how you can create the data cube that is specific to your labels. Uh, the third one, which I will go a bit more in in detail, talks about um, what are the different ways to interact with the toolkit to create the data cube. Uh, the fourth one is a class that you can use to interact with the data cube, and the fifth one is um, uh, an example that talks about how to spin your machine learning pipeline with the nice cube. Yeah, and here's the kind of like architecture diagram, kind of like bird uh, eye view that you can see. So, you, so here you can see that we have a primary uh, like local ISI, ISI images. Uh, so you have primary image and then you have the core registered images um, and then you have the user configuration and uh, the, the labels in the JSON format. So you can, you can take them and then you can easily uh, process them using uh, this class. You can also work with the SAR data cube or the labels data cube, but these are kind of like base classes. So until, unless you are interested in the integrities, I would say you probably don't need to need to interact with them. Uh, yeah, so yeah, if, if you talk about like, this is probably the first thing that you will want to see, okay, how to create data cube with, uh, with the toolkit. Uh, there are different ways to do it. The first one is working with the CLI. So we, you can call the ice cube dash dash help once you have it successfully installed it. So it takes into account uh, the positional argument, which is basically your uh, path to your local directory where you have the rasters and the uh, option you can pass it the labels uh, path as well if you want to get the data cube that one, um, uh, if you want to incorporate your labels as well. And finally, you can save, save the data cube if you want. So these are pretty pretty self-explanatory. As you can see, I'm executing them um, ice cube GL directory and it creates it. It gives me the dimension as well. Um, so since we since we don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna try to expedite this as well. And then we also have this ISA process generate cube class uh, that is kind of like a wrapper on these base classes that helps you to abstract away uh, those those details. And you can pass it to your uh, JSON uh, JSON file and uh, yeah, and basically you can see here that we have a cube configuration. So you have a configuration file. We have some samples that we have included as well. So you can have a look at that. Uh, you configure your um, configuration file and then you just call the create cube and then you have uh, your directory. So you can, it can be a directory that contains SLCs or GRDs. Uh, and then you have the cube configuration file path and finally you can pass, pass it optionally your labels as well. And then it creates the, the data cube and then you can and the data cube is basically an instance of this data cube class. Uh, so it has some nice useful methods and features that you can use. So here you can see, you can call the XR data set and it tells you about, okay, how the data set looks like. So here you can see the coordinates, dimensions, azimuth range, or in the other words, X and Y. And this one is actually generated on a, on a dummy data that, you, that we have included in, in the ice cube as well. Uh, and you can see your data variables, we have intensity, and then we have the labels as well. Yeah, and finally, this uh, there's another section that talks about the cube configuration and the importance of why do we need to, uh, like, why do we actually need to uh, configure these parameters? They can be very, very helpful. Uh, so you can you can change your acquisition dates. So in this case, for example, you're going, uh, I'm asking 
to create a data cube that spans from my 25th of uh, April to 30th of April. Um, and you can change uh, more of fields as you want. You can change the resolution of uh, the, in the time as well. You can have it one day or n day apart. Um, and then you can also work with temporal overlap. Do you want data uh, from the same dates or not? Um, and then finally, you can work with the incidence angles. So these are pretty actually quite uh, quite exhaustive notebooks. Uh, I definitely encourage you to go through all of them and um, and have a look. Um, we have spent spent quite a lot of time on this one to make sure that you can easily pick it up. Um, and finally, we have this data cubes for for ML. Uh, now I will hand over the mic to Agno, who will uh, walk you through the live demo of how to use ice cubes with machine learning. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So, oops. so as uh, Ethan mentioned, like during the presentation, so um, so during the notebook, so we have used like a sample uh, data. So this is like twenty by twenty pixel. So the idea by doing so was um, to give give the people the ability of like running the Jupyter notebook without the burden of like downloading a nine SLC or like ten SLC or a stack of SLC, which can be like up to fifty gigs of data. Uh, but for today's demo, uh, the goal was like to show uh, like a real use case. So for today's demo, we are going to be focused on deforestation, and for and for this, we are going to use a stack of like nine already co-registered SLC. Uh, I don't know if Irfan mentioned it, but uh, the plan is also to just open source a way of co-registering uh, our our images. So the goal is like in the next uh, maybe month to just like open source a container in order to co-register our uh, images SLC and GRT. So just to sum up, um, so during the demo, during today's demo, we are going to go through like a, a segmentation machine learning process using IceCube. So which means that uh, we are going to see how to load the data, how to pre-process the data, and then when we are pre-processed the data, how to visualize it. Uh, because uh, IceCube is not like directly made for machine learning, you can also like uh, visualize the data very like uh, easily. And then it's like how you can just integrate IceCube library into any machine learning uh, library. So for the uh, purpose of the demo, we we have used uh, uh, PyTorch, uh, but you can you can do like almost any any other like uh, machine learning library. So let's uh, start the demo. So. So as I often mention it, um, so there is like different way of like creating a data cube. So for uh, today's demo, we are going to use the ISI process generate cube uh, class uh, with uh, the um, with the default uh, configuration, which means that we are not going to do any filtering, and we are going just uh, and no, and we are not going to define any temporal resolution as well. And by no, non defining any temporal resolution, I mean that we are going to take the nine SLC, we are going to stack them, and we are going to build the data queue. As you can see, it's like quite fast to load the SLC. So I often mention it, but we use Dask on the background, uh, which means that like every time we are going to just load the image, we are going to do a lazy loading. Um, but which means that um, we are going to load the data into our memory if and only we are going to use or load or save the data. Because for for uh, today's demo, we are going to use 9 SLC, as I said. So this is uh, approximately 4 gigs of data. And we are going to use SLC. So this is the single look complex file for uh, people on the call who are, uh, who are not familiar with like um, SLC and SAR in general. So the SLC is a product uh, that, that is going to conserve a phase information. So in the file, we, we are going to have like two layers. Uh, we are going to have a real and the complex and a combination of both are going to uh, form the phase and the intensity. So uh, so now that we have created the data cube, which is called DC here, we can we can see what we have uh, inside the data. So inside the data, we have the band, which represents the date. So for example, in, in, in this case, we are going to use like data from the 21st of July until like the, the 2nd of August. We have nine, nine images. We have the azimuth and the range. So once again, uh, if if some people are not familiar with the SAR geometry, azimuth and range, you can see as like the spatial coordinate X and Y or lat and long. Uh, and we have the real and the complex, uh, which represent like the, the real data and the value of the image. Uh, and, and also we have a label because like ice cube is made for machine learning purpose. Uh, for sure, you can use it for visualize uh, the data. You can, you can use it for pre-processing the data. Uh, but the main goal is like to uh, create a structure and infrastructure in order just to integrate into uh, machine learning processes. 
Um, and so when, when we have the data, uh, so as uh, ML, uh, ML process, uh, basically, or like almost any like ML, ML process, you will need like to preprocess the data. So for today's demo, we, we decided like to create like the intensity and the phase, which is like the um, most, common, most common like uh, layer that you're going to manipulate with the SAR. And once again, uh, using the advantage of using Dask, uh, you can see that you can just load it and just create the layer like um, quickly. And it's due to the fact that uh, it's, it's not going to load and not do, going to, to do any computation until uh, you are going to just like load the data or save the data. And as you can see that we have added like two, two different layers. So we have added now the intensity and the phase uh, in our <laughs> data queue. Sorry. Uh, and so now, now as uh, ML, uh, ML engineer or ML like, uh, enthusiast, you are like quite happy because you you have your data and now you want to start like uh, an ML process. But first, you need to visualize the data. And one advantage of using IceCube is like you can visualize the data and you can see what you have inside your data queue. So the first one is like you can you can just slice uh, along like the um, azimuth and range uh, dimension, which means that you can slice along the uh, sp uh, spatial dimension, and you can do it like very easily like using uh, indexes. So for example, here we are going to take like um, 10,000 to 15,000 pixels uh, along like uh, azimuth and range. And you can see that you can visualize the intensity, you can visualize the phase, and you can visualize the label. So in, in, in the case, on the use case of today, so the label represents the deforestation that happened between like the first uh, image and the last one. So every time you are going to see a value of one, uh, the value of one means that uh, the pixel have been deforested uh, through the time during like the first image and the last image. Um, but as we have the temporal dimension and the time dimension, we can do way more than like just a special uh, slicing. So we can also slice along the time dimension. And this is like the power of like Ice Cube. Uh, because we can just create like a kind of video of kind of like GIF of what happened between the first and the last uh, image. And so if if we are able like to take, for example, as we are able like to, to transform from the raster, we are able to go like to the um, Sloan geometry. We are able like to select interesting pixel uh, for the video, but it's like also good like as a machine learning uh, process in a machine learning process, it's it's good like to load the data and visualize the data to see if it is okay or not. And IceCube is like really good for visualizing the data. So for for example, here in this example, so we are going to slice along the spatial dimension, but we are going to show like each date and each date represent one image. And as you can see, it's like there is a change in texture uh, that represent. Uh, that represent the area that have been deforested uh, through the time and through the stack of images. And of course, uh, you have intensity, but you have also the, oops, sorry. And you have also the phase information. And what we wanted to show here is like the phase uh, for a single uh, image uh, is maybe, is not going to bring like uh, so many information and not new information about deforestation. But the, the, the good thing is like, as we are going to manipulate stack of images, uh, phase can be like very useful in order to combine information at the stack level. Um, and so now, uh, what we wanted to show is like, okay, now you have like, you know, ML pro, uh, in like machine learning, like a regular machine learning process, you will need like to preprocess the data. So what we, what we did is like to create the intensity interface, you will need like to visualize the data. So you can just uh, slice along all the dimension of the data queue and just visualize the data. And you now you need like a step further and you need to see like how to integrate like uh, IceCube into like machine learning process. And so, Sorry. And this is what, what we do here. So the data set is, the, uh, is a class made by PyTorch. And so the goal here is like to overload the class, the data set. And this is like normal to any, um, uh, is, is normal using like a PyTorch as a machine learning library. You will need to do the same if you use uh, TensorFlow. If you, know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you use Chaos, you will need to just like overload like the data set class. And so the data, the data set class is, uh, basically an iterator where you're going to send the data as a batch. And so here in, in, in uh, IceCube case, we can use XBatcher. And XBatcher is like really nice because it's, it just allows to slice along all the dimension of the data cube. So for today's example, we are going to slice along azimuth and range dimension. So we are going to use 512 by 512. This is like the basic uh, input for uh, neural network model. Uh, but 
I, I would like encourage you like to, to check it out, like our documentation. We have also over example because we can also slice along the time dimension. So for so for example, here as we slice along only as you can range, like the final output will contain the nine uh, images. So nine in, in like the temporal dimension. Uh, but but you can also slice along the time dimension. One good thing as well is like you can just create overlap uh, in, into the data. So you can create overlap into the special, but also the temporal dimension. Uh, and it's like really useful. For example, uh, if you worked on uh, crop classification is and you have one and you want one image uh, per month, you can you can you can you can do it. And you can also slice, for example, as um, uh, no network uh, input is fixed. You can also say, like for example, I want like three months, so three images, uh, and I want like the fixed uh, spatial resolution as well. And so, if if we continue and just to see what we have uh, in our data set, so as I explained, so we have one because we have selected a batch size of one. Uh, I'm on uh, my local uh, computer, so le le let's uh, let's stay like small in in, to, in term of batch size. Um, we have like uh, two layer, which is like the phase and the intensity. We have nine in the temporal dimension, uh, which represents our nine images. And we have 512 by 512 that represent the, uh, the spatial um, representation. And for the label, we have uh, only one and we don't have any temp uh, temporality uh, because what, what we want to predict at the end is like only one uh, raster that represents the deforestation that happened during the first and the last uh, image. And so if we if we start visualizing what we have uh, in our uh, tensor, you can see, so we can just visualize the intensity of the first image, the intensity of the last image, and, and, and the phase. But the most important is like, you can see like a change in texture and the intensity domain, and you have a label associated. And so if there, if there is like uh, any ML practitioner in the call, uh, I mean, at least he talked to me, I hope he ring a bell for you as well, but it's like, okay, now I can start like uh, creating my data set. I can start creating, playing with the data and start playing uh, and start like modeling and just um, um, working with uh, model. Um, we know that like uh, some people um, don't like to to work online, but they they also want to work to work offline. So you can you can just save your data sets as a normal data set on your disk. Um, so if you execute it, um, you you will be able to save uh, I, uh, um, your label and your data into your local disk. And like this, you can just go offline and just like double check the quality of the data and just remove them from uh, your training data set. So it's totally uh, totally possible. So for, 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 for this case, you can see the label. Um, so, so the yellow uh, area represents the deforestation and the black one represents like the non, no, no change. Uh, and you can also see the data. So for each um, for each like uh, sample or each tile, you will have the intensity and the phase. And if you if you go very quickly, you can see the intensity and you can see the phase. Uh, the phase. And the good thing is like if you want to work offline, you, you can also do it and you can just uh, work on it. And and now. Um, and now that we have like created our data sets, we also want like to trigger like a, um, a training and a deep learning like training for segmentation for deforestation. Um, yeah. And so the purpose of the demo is like to sh uh, to showcase um, to showcase the advantage of using IceCube. Uh, we will not we will not go like into the details of like deep learning. Uh, about deforestation, uh, Tapio Friberg. I've, done, uh, I've made a, a talk uh, a few weeks ago about like uh, what we did uh, about deep learning and 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 going into the details. So the main focus of the talk is like to focus really on the infrastructure uh, and um, and and IceCube and to show like how you can just like create like a, a pipeline. Uh, of a machine learning pipeline, which means like you process the data, you visualize the data, you create your training and the test data set. And then now for any ML practitioner, they can just start uh, working on, on like modeling and just like deep learning or, or any machine learning model. So for uh, today use case, so we are going to use a 3D convolution uh, neural network. So instead of using like a 2D, uh, we are going to use also the temporality. Um, and the goal is like to predict like what happened during the first and the last image and to predict the deforestation. So I, tr I trained like just, just before, like uh, just before uh, coming to the talk, I just trained like 10 minutes over like two epochs. Um, and so I'm not going to, to, run, uh, to run any model. 
uh, but if you if you if you can see here is like the output of a model um, so here is like the actual mask and here is like uh, the prediction of a model train over like the two epoch so for sure uh, so it's not perfect but but it was really good that like in 50 minutes we have been able like to trigger uh, um, a training and now we we are able also like to iterate over the over the model and just like to improve it um, and we found it like very useful like to trigger like processes very quickly and just like uh, manipulate a stack of uh, SAR uh, images. So hopefully uh, the library is going to be also useful for you and hopefully it's like the demo um, show you uh, that you can maybe uh, use our library in our uh, in your current like processes and I uh, encourage you also to visit the, uh, to just click and just like uh, read the documentation uh, the github repository and uh, I think it's time for if you have any question uh, we will be uh, happy like to answer uh, any of your uh, question yeah sure so I think we we got some nice questions uh, we don't have a lot of time but we'll try to address as many of them as possible uh, let's see uh, Okay, maybe not participants, but if you go to the, okay, to the question se session. Okay, so the first question is, okay, is it possible to use the code for um, Critics Data Cube out of Sentinel images? Um, so right now we support uh, the, the ISI uh, data out of, uh, out of the box. Uh, you can work with Sentinel, but it comes with a bit of limited functionality. So you cannot really do the cube configuration. So partly I would say you can work on it, but this is something that uh, we, we will see if it's if it's something that we have to put on our roadmap. Um, maybe maybe the community can can uh, contribute on this part as well. But uh, let's see. Uh, so the question is uh, partly yes, part partly no. Uh, and then uh, so there was a question about probably the data cube has already processed SLC data. If yes, how it was processed? Did you use some snap um, algorithms? Uh, so please, please feel free to know Wayne as well. I think this should be so the, pre pretty much so we have covered. Like yeah. raw data. Uh, it hasn't been uh, processed, but you can just uh, pre-process the images online and you can use uh, IceCube like later uh, into into the, the process. Yeah. And one thing I want to mention, is what we don't want to like tie the hands of the user to something. So something we, we is, is it that is on our roadmap is that we will provide this kind of functions that you can assign to your chunks in the SLC and then you can easily process them. Um, if we do a custom pre-processing that it means that uh, there might be there might be better way to do processing and we like just, uh, just tying the hands of the user. So I would say it's good to explore as much as possible, but of course, uh, but the functions we will, we will definitely uh, include them. Yeah. Um, uh, so SIF software was used core registration. Do you have a own developed software for this one? So for this one, we are going to have a Docker uh, with that works with Snap. Uh, there's another one that you can also check. It's like the GFOC that is an open source library as well that works on the spatial uh, information to the core registration. Uh, but this one will use uh, core registration with Snap uh, in the Docker. So yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, is it possible to read part of entire image into memory? I think this should be clear after seeing the seeing the demo, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can you can do that as, as you saw as as Agno Agno showed as well. Um, is there a feature to get a geocoded result? Not at the moment, uh, but uh, yeah, this this is an interesting interesting uh, feature request. Uh, we will we'll see how what what to uh, what to do about that in in the future. Um, and the next one probably, yeah, it goes to goes to Agno. Does the current implementation using X batcher allows yeah. random uh, so, batches on the fly? Yeah, we just um, I think we, we face the exact same issue. Is like uh, doing the batches on the fly is going to be like um, not as fast as like saving the data and like processing them after. So you you can you can do it, but it's going to be like um, uh, for sure it's going to be like a kind of bottleneck, and we have faced the exact same issue. Um, so for now, we are going to use XBatcher uh, to do the to do the batches. Uh, but maybe later, if we just realize that it's not like fast enough, maybe we will think about like another solution to just like uh, create it. Yeah, and the last question is uh, from Nicola. Could this work with insert data stacks able to compute all interferograms? 
a very good question and that was one of the reasons that we wanted to um keep the information not just in in the ground range but also in the slant range as well so you have the face information so if you want to do uh for example analysis on the face and you want to calculate uh, do the coherence analysis or even like interferograms you can definitely do that uh, yeah thanks a lot uh we again as, as we mentioned uh, we are really excited about this one and uh, I think anything that you make great, it's not really possible by just getting inside the room and just writing all the features, dumping all the features. And this is where, where I think we really need the support or the active collaboration from the community. We want to hear it from you guys. What do you guys think? What works? What doesn't work? Um, and then uh, we can we can iterate on that to to improve it uh, and base basically bridging this gap that that we see there uh yeah so yeah thanks a lot for being here really great questions um i guess that's that's it from my side i don't yeah. know do you have any final words no no uh, thanks for attending and hopefully um you find it useful and hopefully you can just uh now now see how to use it uh in in your like current processes yeah thank you and uh hope to hear from some of you guys on on the github yeah. so yeah happy cubing Thank <laughs> you.